Great. Well, welcome, everybody. It's good to see everyone here. And uh, thanks to folks who are dialing in on Zoom. So uh, my name is Colin Boyle. I'm the chair of the board of the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. And I'd like to welcome everybody to our 2023 annual meeting for mem members. Uh, it's great to have so many folks here and, and uh, bring people together uh, in person and on Zoom to connect. We have a, a very interesting agenda for today and a chance for lots of interaction as well. So I look forward to, to meeting many of you and, and getting a chance to, to speak with you and hear from our, our panelists and lightning talks and from our uh, keynote speaker. Um, the, uh, the Alliance uh, came together a number of years ago to solve a particular problem in global health, which is that uh, global health uh, and the problems in global health are really hard and they require different sectors to come together uh, to solve them. And so uh, we have over the last several years uh, built the Alliance to represent over 80 members now, uh, organizations uh, with affiliations to the Bay Area. They're not all located here. In fact, most are not, uh, but with uh, touch points to the Bay Area, interested in working together. Uh, organizations from academia, from, uh, from industry, the tech sector, the biomedical research sector, and, and other sectors in, in the private sector, uh, nonprofits, philanthropy, a whole host of organizations, all of whom believe that uh, we can do more together than we can individually. And so uh, we're delighted to have this opportunity to connect. And uh, Sarah Anderson, our, our uh, prolific executive director, wave in the back, thank you, Sarah. Um, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll have a chance later on today to provide a bit of an update on the state of the Alliance. Um, so please look, look forward to that. Um, a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. First of all, it's, it's wonderful to be back at UCSF. I, I spent about eight, year, eight years here with the Institute for Global Health Sciences, and so it's wonderful to be back. Uh, special thanks to some of my former colleagues who helped organize uh, today and put this together. Jaime Sepulveda will be coming in a little while, who's uh, the executive director for IGHS. I see Jeremy here. And of course, Robert Mansfield, who's quickly dashing to get off screen, but is you know, the person who actually runs everything at UCSF. So thank you, Robert, for all of your, your help and support. Um, we have a number of people who are on, on Zoom as well, and you'll see them behind me and, and on the screen. And it's always hard, I, I know, to have a hybrid meeting, but we've made a couple of efforts here to really try to make this more inclusive and uh, supportive for folks who are dialing in who aren't able to be here in person. Uh, so one thing we've done is we've made this um, a, not a webinar, but a, a Zoom call. And so that's an opportunity for people to kind of engage more than you can in a typical webinar. And so over the course of, of the event, I'd like to ask uh, people to get to know each other and to take advantage of Zoom, take advantage of being in the room together here. Uh, for folks on Zoom, uh, introduce yourselves uh, to each other, use the chat. Uh, you can direct message people. Uh, my, my kids have told me that um, a stranger on Zoom is just a friend you haven't met yet. And so this is an opportunity for all of you online to get to know each other, as we'll do the same here. And I, hopefully that'll, that'll help forge more uh, community and connection across uh, the organizations represented today. We have uh, more than uh, 50 member organizations joining the event today. So a uh, great opportunity for networking and connection. Um, um, we also would ask people to come back on camera if you can during, during the Q&A uh, and, and be, be an active participant. We'll be tracking questions posed in the chat. Uh, in addition, um, uh, please mute yourself uh, during the Q&A session, just because so, we, we're, we're working with technology here. We want to make sure everybody can hear the, the speakers. So you could just do that uh, and then come back off for the uh, Q&A sessions. That would be helpful. Um, in terms of um, just getting to know people, uh, the Alliance is all about connection and, and uh, uh, meeting people and convenings. And so that, that's often helped if you know who to go to. And so can I ask uh, members of the board of directors of, of the Alliance to sort of raise your hand? I've got pictures here. So we have a few folks in the room and then folks on Zoom, please raise your hand as well if you, if you can. Uh, so those are folks um, who, who you can uh, ask dumb questions to. Uh, and, and there are no dumb questions. So you can ask any question to them. Uh, and please take advantage of that. If, if you have a, a question about the work of the Alliance or, or who, who's working on something that you want to learn more about, that's a good first point of contact. Um, uh, a second and probably better point of contact is our staff. And so let me ask the staff who are here to sort of raise your hands. And sort of, uh, so we have Abby and Madhavi, we have Sarah, and we have uh, Lisa wandering around somewhere. Uh, so, so please uh, take advantage of the folks who are here to, to sort of reach out if you have any, any questions at all. Um, 
we uh, we'll also be collecting some information over the course of the day. And so if I could, uh, Madhavi, if you could change the slides to the QR code. Uh, for the folks who are here in the room, we have a QR code, which is a link to a, uh, um, a, a Google Doc or, or a, a mechanism to kind of form to capture information and questions. So please feel free to use that as an easy way to kind of reflect your thoughts and questions. For folks on Zoom, um, we, we also uh, will we'll, we'll post a, a tiny URL link in the chat from time to time. Uh, and please use the chat and we'll, we'll use the technology to help us all kind of ask questions and get to know each other and learn a little bit more. Um, so uh, with, with that, let me, let me just turn quickly to the agenda and what we'll be covering today. We have a, a very full agenda. Um, we're gonna start off in, in just a minute or two with a, a wonderful key, um, um, keynote fireside chat, which is kind of a blending of, of different formats there. Uh, we're very fortunate to have um, uh, Jean Philbert Senyamana, who is the uh, uh, Chief Digital Health Advisor for the African CDC, who's going to be uh, speaking with Martin Dale, uh, who is the uh, Director of, uh, uh, of, I always get Martin's title wrong, he's with the Population Services International, he's Director of Digital and uh, plays a key role on the Alliance board as our secretary as well. And so uh, we're very fortunate to have Martin and, and Jean Philbert uh, to, to lead us off. Then we'll have uh, a discussion on, on AI. What, have, you, have anybody here heard of AI? Anybody? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so obviously a very hot topic, but what does it mean for global health? Uh, I think, you know, and the point of AI is it's supposed to be a very general purpose technology that cuts across many different applications. And so we'll spend a bit of time exploring some of the maybe more atypical applications of AI, which I think will be an interesting uh, thing to get you thinking. Um, and then uh, Sarah will come up and we'll talk about the state of the Alliance, uh, some of the work that's underway at the Alliance uh, with lightning talks. So just kind of teasers from people about some of the work that we're doing together to get you interested and excited and to give you a, a face to reach out to, a person to reach out to if you have questions or interest in uh, collaborating with us. So that's the goal uh, for today. Uh, I think it'll be a, a very rich discussion. Uh, and we'll have breaks as well, in which case I, I hope everybody takes full advantage of them to network and to get to know each other. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to, to Martindale. Martin, thank you so much for, for doing this remotely. Um, can you say something just to make sure we know that the technology works? Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? <laughs> yes, we can. Thank you, Martin. And, and uh, over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yes. Uh, so, as Colin said, we're going to kick off with a chat um, where I will be discussing with Phil um, uh, regarding digital innovations and partnerships and, you know, how we can use them to advance global health equity in Africa. Um, so, this topic is of particular interest to the Alliance because the Alliance has slowly been um, shifting direction towards trying to strengthen uh, relationships with health actors in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Um, it's a global health alliance and, and it's, its ambition is around advancing global health. So it's really important for, for those ties between actors within these settings uh, to be strengthened with uh, our alliance members. Um, so Africa CDC is a really good starting point when we're thinking about how to strengthen ties with um, um, uh, different actors in Africa. So Africa CDC uh, was set up to strengthen uh, capacity and capability of public health institutions across Africa. Um, so they work very closely with member states and um, they've just released uh, a digital strategy uh, that Phil is going to be talking about shortly. And so this presents a really interesting avenue for the Alliance to sort of look at the strategy and see where we can have input and where there can be win-win collaboration um, with Africa CDC and also with member states and the governments um, uh, that they support. And that's pretty much the, the, the focus of this chat. Um, so yeah, Phil, thank you so much for taking time in your extremely busy calendar um, to speak to us today. And um, yeah, maybe you could introduce yourself and um, say a few things about uh, your strategy. And if you have some slides, feel free to sort of uh, bring them up as well. Absolutely. Thanks, Martin. And good morning, good morning, everyone. It's such a great pleasure being here. Thanks for having me today. I absolutely believe in the same thing as you, that uh, uh, there is a lot we can do individually, but we can do a lot more collectively. And um, I remember during my time, so part of my, my work previously, I served as Minister of uh, Information Technology and Youth in the Government of Rwanda 
for six years. And I remember when I joined, uh, there were two main telecom operators. And when I uh, talked to the CEOs of both companies, they had never sh shaken hands of each other. And for me, I needed connectivity in very remote areas. And I need them to work together because some of the infrastructure made sense only when shared. So I realized that even competitors at some point, they you know, gain in working together. So uh, I, I just want to commend the effort of coming together as partners to see how uh, you can you know, collectively put your expertise and goodwill and resources towards advance, advancing our global health goals. Uh, and uh, this is of a particular interest to Africa and especially uh, the input on technology, uh, the Bay Area being uh, globally the place where the most innovation has come from and still coming from. Uh, we, we, we look up to you guys and the organizations that you represent to provide the, the expert uh, leadership and, and uh, technology leadership and policy leadership that we need to be able to accelerate the transformation of, uh, of our health systems using technology. So that said, uh, Martin, I would say that um, um, I have a few slides. Let me just uh, pop them in. If you can just by thumb up, thumbs up, confirm you can yeah. see it. Yeah. I'd like to take a few minutes just to take you through what we just communicated to our 55 governments, member states, and our, our partners who are working with us. Africa CDC, by way of background, is six years old. We spent uh, uh, the first three years uh, in fighting COVID. So technically we are three years old. So uh, that's it's important uh, as we move into the presentation to, to keep in mind that we are a very, very young institution, pretty much modeled alongside the same principles as, as the US CDC, uh, but also keen to learn from other public health institutions around the world. So this strategy, we, we launched it on uh, 6th of March in Kigali during uh, one, of, one, one of the conferences. Uh, and the question at that time, I remember Paul saying, oh, there is the African Union, uh, countries have their digital strategy. Why another strategy by an Africa CDC? I think it's important to realize that a continent, Africa is going, uh, is undergoing a massive shift trying to build a, uh, a single continental trade area. So we are trying to form one market. Right now we are 55 markets and we understand that we cannot be competitive in any sector if we continue to be fragmented in small markets. So politically, economically, strategically, there is a lot of push for Africa to come together as a continent and health is not left behind. There is a new public health order that been launched, which serves as the guiding uh, sort of uh, North Star in everything that we do. And it has five pillars. And the five pillars is Africa needs to build stronger public health institutions, uh, strengthen its public health workforce, expand its capacity for manufacturing, diagnostics and therapeutics, uh, increase domestic resources and investment into healthcare, uh, health security, and then promote respectful and action-oriented partnerships. So these are, the, these are the principles that really try to summarize what we learned from the COVID pandemic. And especially when you look at bullet number three and realize that there was a point where we realized we were so much exposed because a lot of what we depended on to respond to uh, the pandemic uh, had to be important almost 100%. So, uh, but also uh, public health institutions uh, showed major gaps that need to be bridged. Uh, we knew we had gaps in public uh, workforce, but now the question is how do we accelerate the move towards bridging those gaps? Then finally, I think respectful and action-oriented partnerships is very important because again, um, healthcare, in Africa is, made, is, is still very much driven by, by governments and governments uh, invest mostly uh, donor uh, resources and donor funds. And it's important that the financing of care uh, shifts towards more domestic investments 
uh, because that's the only way we can uh, manage and reduce and eliminate progressively the dependency uh, of the public health to uh, other parts of the world and then enter into a, a mode of co-dependency or collaboration. Um, so the key benefits we expect from the digital transformation strategy are equity, and I won't even explain any of this because I would be preaching to the converted accessibility, you know, given the fact that uh, digital is, uh, is the form of infrastructure that is the most available, that reach the, mo the, the most amount of people, especially in remote areas, affordability, quality of care, uh, capacity of the workforce, and creating opportunity, especially for the health tech sector, which is really fast growing. We have big ambitions for growing the health tech as a new economic sector. Uh, we are looking at leveraging technology to increase capabilities of uh, public health institutions, uh, allowing them to do things that today they can't do, like you know, integrated disease surveillance and response in the real time, uh, not as a pilot project, but something that reaches everywhere. Then strengthen accountability of public health institutions, uh, be able to allow us to scale successful experience. And, and programs much more quickly, and then also increase efficiency of, uh, of, of institutions. So the, the, the 10 why, uh, 10 words ending with why, I think it's a mnemonic way to memorize the, the, the key benefits that we expect from this new strategy. Then in terms of guiding principles, I would say that all, the, all those are principles as you can read them, uh, but the most important, we want to shift it to a patient-centric approach. Uh, much, much of digitization over the last few decades were enterprise uh, or, or institutional-centric, responding to the needs of product providers and policymakers as really opposed to uh, responding to the needs of the patients. So that's where we are, we are, we are shifting. We are embracing open standards and digital public infrastructure and digital public goods. Uh, we want to promote more national ownership of health systems. This is in reaction to the fact that a lot of digital systems and data collection systems do uh, collect this information for reporting and for satisfying the donor's requirements. And we want this to change. We want to have a very strong gender lens in everything we do. Uh, promote equity and inclusion, basically avoid to use technology to multiply the inequities and exclusions that the, the world has created so far. Um, so uh, we also looked at global uh, principles, uh, as you see on this circle, in terms of uh, uh, thinking through our priorities, uh, we use this existing framework, which allows us to make sure that we've captured uh, everything uh, spanning from infrastructure, policy, investment, leadership and governance, uh, having the right systems architecture, uh, thinking through services and applications that we need, and then wrapping that around change management and workforce development, uh, building a vibrant data use ecosystem, all centered around people. So this is a, a framework that was developed by PATH and, and it's called dual framework. And I'm sure many of you even participated in, in, uh, in developing this framework. So we, we scanned through and double clicked on everything to make sure that uh, this, this strategy uh, has the benefit of coming late and leveraging the wisdom that has already been generated. Um, so, over the last six years of Africa CDC existence, there was, I mean, the institution grew very, very rapidly, but there was no digital, in the initial design, there was, uh, you know, health, inf strategic health information uh, systems department, which never got staffed. Uh, and when we came, you know, there is a limit to how much you can change the org structure of an institution. It takes a long process. So what we are going to do is to put up, to put in place, a digital delivery and innovation team uh, that will be attached to the office of the director general and connects 
the different existing departments. You can see, you can see them here. Um, management and administration, disease surveillance and, and disease intelligence, workforce development, lab networks, emergency preparedness response. Those are the five existing departments. And this team is going to nest itself between those departments, strengthen them, support them, but most importantly, extend support to our member states through what we call a flagship initiative initiatives. So these are the flagship initiatives. Uh, I can run through them quickly. Uh, we started off with three and then through conversations with partners, they grew to six, then 10. By the time we launched the strategy in Kigali in March, we had 10, but as you can count, they are 16 and, ca and counting. And I don't know if you realize even at the first slide, we didn't give this strategy a time frame because we both know technology will change, new uh, technologies are going to be available when we launched, you know, ChatGPT wasn't a thing, but now it's on everyone's mind. So uh, we, we, we said, let's do this as a first edition and let's not even predetermine where the second edition is going to come uh, to come at. It's almost like a, an open book, you know, depending on demand, we'll see when we have enough change requests to aggregate them into a second edition. So that's why from March, uh, we came up with these additional uh, flagships. So in green, you see the projects that have already taken off somehow. So we have, the Health Connect Africa, which is a project to connect all health facilities and community health workers across the continent. I'm saying it's took off not because it's fully funded, but because we already have a team we're working with UNICEF. Uh, they did something called GIGA to connect schools. So we are reusing everything they have developed in terms of mapping the schools, where the schools are thinking through uh, invest, investment and business case development and so on. And then we have already started to hire a team that will uh, do the job, this job. This public health informatic net, net, informatics network is also being launched in September. It's, it's, it's funded. This is a group of eminent, like the, the cream de la cream in terms of public health, uh, digital public health experts, policymakers. They will be, they will undergo a training of one year uh, and, and get mentorship from Africa CDC and the leading national public health institutions across the continent. Through that one year, they go back to their respective positions, really lead digital health transformation in their respective countries. Uh, there's gonna be an index to measure the maturity of digital health across different countries. It's gonna be launched in, in October. Uh, then there, are, there, there, there is the Africa Health Tech Summit which is an annual convening of digital health community on the continent. We had the first edition of this event last year. We are doing the next in October. Uh, Africa Women in Digital Health is a new project uh, which will evolve into a network, but it's already launched and seed funded, uh, uh, also based out of Senegal, Dakar, and so on and so forth. I can go through everything here, but I just want to say uh, we are very agile in the way we think about these projects, coming up with an idea, looking at what could be an MVP, getting started uh, and continue enriching, uh, refining the scope, mobilizing support and resources, but avoiding to lose momentum uh, into uh, bureaucracy, which uh, as we know can kill so many things. Uh, I can come back later to some of this, if any of this, is of interest to, 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 to your members, uh, digitizing primary care, which is probably the largest initiative we have. Uh, the Pan-African Health Informatics Network, basically doing what you've done, but at the scale of the African continent, uh, connected diagnostics, the innovation and uh, data sandbox, uh, supply chain, AI, data governance, uh, workforce development, uh, IDSR, and, and uh, internal digitization of Africa CDC uh, processes. This is one way we've looked at how to think through the, connect, the connectedness of those initiatives. They may, they may look like they are isolated, but they are very, very connected. Um, so at the most fundamental level, we, we have infrastructure, access, internet, 
devices, data centers, electricity. We have to think through all of that at the best, you know, basic fundamental, the most fundamental layer. Then on top of it, we look at the human capacity, women, workforce development, convening, you know, the, the, the fellowship. And then uh, up, we, we start looking at innovation and governance. And then we look at a few vertical, verticalized programs, but all uh, aimed at uh, reaching the universal health coverage goals by 2030, uh, strengthening our health systems and improving the health outcomes of our people. So um, what next after we launched this uh, digital transformation strategy, it was uh, March, we gave ourselves a deadline of June 30th to finish uh, the design sprint for each of the initiatives. So uh, um, there is a partner working group around each initiative. In fact, we have 65 partners and the number grows every day. Um, and we invite partners to look at the flagship that resonates the most with your work or where their expertise can make a difference. And then they join the conversation uh, with an objective of coming up with sort of a pitch deck or detailed project plan, if you will, just showing us uh, how much we need to invest, who needs to do what, where, what is the implementation approach. And then every six months, we're going to be doing sort of sprints to have a regular checkpoint uh, uh, for each project to see that we are, we are making progress. Some projects are going to be seven-year projects with uh, overall goal being to achieve something by 2030. We are not allowing to, to go beyond that. But for everyone, we also want to see a sort of a short, medium, and long-term goal. So all of them have to decide where they want to be by end of this year. Many of them have chosen to get to something by the next health tech summit, which is October. And that really allows us to make sure that we have a cadence that keeps people accountable to what they, they committed to. Um, so another important principle we agreed is co-creation, uh, just recognizing that the expertise is distributed among partners uh, and asking everyone to come on board and, and, and share ideas. And then from there, a very clear uh, roles, responsibility, commitments is going to emerge. And then uh, bilateral relationships are going to develop between Africa CDC and those partners or between the partners in our member states, depending on where the opportunity is. So that's what I wanted to share. Uh, let me end by sharing this uh, save the date. We are going to have our second health tech summit in Kigali uh, in October 17 to 19. I'd very much like to extend an invitation to the members of the Bay Area Global Health uh, Alliance to participate collectively individually and we are available to talk through the details if there is interest. Uh, once again, thank you for your kind attention and the opportunity to be part of this conversation today. Back to you, uh, Martin. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, yeah, this is a pretty exciting and ambitious strategy. Um, and as you said earlier, it's going to take a team. Uh, it, it'll take a village to actually deliver this strategy really well. Um, so uh, my first question to you is um, regarding cross-sector collaboration. Um, so the purpose of the Alliance um, is to try and foster cross-sector collaboration so that you, we can advance global health. Um, so what can you say about your relationship with different health actors? Uh, so CDC's relationship with different health actors. So you know, if you think tech, NGO, academia, and then what's your opinion around the importance of that cross-sector collaboration happening between those partners? So first of all, I would, I would say that this strategy itself was developed through cross-sector collaboration. I remember when I joined, um, I, I asked the, my, my boss, uh, at that time it was Dr. John Kengasong, who's now uh, the ambassador Kengasong, who's now, uh, the director of PEPFA, we had a conversation and I told him like, uh, you know, there is, there is a digital health graveyard where you have 
strategies which were never implemented, solutions which never reached scale, other solutions which never reached, uh, left the lab to, to, to start implementation. I told him like, the only way we guard against those kind of failures from the beginning is to make sure that we are very open and transparent and we involve uh, people across the board. We involve the governments, we involved uh, my colleagues within Africa CDC, we involved our partner, we involve our partners who've been investing in digital health for decades and have infinitely more knowledge and, uh, and wisdom on, on doing these things than a public institution like Africa CDC. And he bought into that narrative. And I also asked, let's be agile, let's be action oriented. So we started this very transparently, uh, reaching out to as many partners as uh, we could. Uh, the question would be, if we were so open, how come none of the members here in this room ever heard about this before today? So we are also very much aware of our blind spots. We know that uh, not everyone uh, was uh, were able to, to, to hear that call to action and, and join us. And especially I have to confess the private sector we, we did not do enough with the private sector and to some extent as well with the academia. We worked so much uh, with uh, the traditional development partners and that was very, very helpful. We worked so much with the governments, uh, but beyond those two groups of partners, I have to say that we still have a long way to go to involve the private sector, the innovation community and the academia. But I, I think behind your question, there is the answer, which is this uh, ambitious agenda over such a huge continent cannot be achieved if, there are, if every available resource is not harnessed. And that can only be done through cross-collaboration partnerships. And I would say also that uh, as, as a sign that we are committed to that, uh, as you saw in the next steps, we are very much still open on uh, having new ideas and new partners onto our partner uh, partner working groups around every flagship initiative. This is another way of promoting cross-partner collaboration. And through uh, the, that design process, we hope that uh, very concrete areas of actions by the private sector, by the civil society, by uh, the development community will emerge and then we'll start working with them uh, in whatever format is the most appropriate. Great, great. And the Alliance is open for business um, uh, to try and partner with Africa CDC. Um, but I think it's a, it's a pretty good opportunity for us to advance our goals around strengthening ties with um, uh, players in Africa. So if you look at the alliance and the way we are established and the memberships uh, uh, that we have, you know, where do you see opportunity? Have you got any examples of areas where the alliance could potentially contribute uh, uh, to supporting the strategy? Okay, let me jump to the slide with, with the flagship initiatives. Perhaps that can help uh, right. visualizing a, a few of the areas of collaboration. First of all, I think each one of these projects and areas, there will be one or more members of your, of your alliance who specialize or do business in these domains. Um, but if you come, come to mind, first of all, I can see this uh, data and innovation sandbox. So the data in innovation sandbox is a mechanism that we decided to put in place to promote homegrown health tech innovation. Uh, one of the barriers towards uh, against scaling of uh, health tech innovations in Africa is mm. remains the fragmentation of the market, a, a very fragmented uh, policy and regulatory landscape. So we want to see how can we use concrete, like match the demand for scale with the supply of access to market. So. Um, a health tech company formed out of Nairobi wants to do business in Nigeria, but then finds, and we saw that with the mobile money or, or fintech, you find the regulatory landscape is completely different. So we want to use very concrete cases of innov innovation, a demand-based approach to identify uh, areas where we can harmonize best our policies. So policy harmonization is going to be one pillar of, uh, of the sandbox policy and regulatory. 
But most importantly, we want to also set up a tech infrastructure that allows us to test and vet those innovations. For us to be able to say as Africa CDC, we know this application, we've looked at it, we've tested it, it works, it, it, it does what it says it does. And uh, the way it uh, handles patient data, for example, is something that is in line with our policies and data governance principles. So we recommend, we pick this one and we recommend this to our member states. You know, previously there was this, and it's, there still is, especially within the UN system, but also at the African Union, the Africa CDC, this kind of uh, principle of neutrality. You know, pick winners and losers. But for me, I, I see it's the only way we are actually going to use technology to solve for public health problems. Because if we can't pick something that works and put political and financial support behind it so that it helps us solve the problem at large scale, we, we, are, we are playing against ourselves. And I think that is getting understood, but we need this kind of mechanism to test our innovation. So if it's an AI-based solution, we want to be able to say, hey, we've, we've looked at it and we've looked at how uh, data for, for, the, uh, uh, for you know, the algorithm and we've looked at um, uh, how data is processed and uh, how decisions are arrived at and we believe it's, it's acceptable and it's good. And by the way, it's scalable. The cost is manageable. It's something that governments can take on and we can, it's easy to build capacity for, for this and so on and so forth. And then when the, when the solution checks a few critical boxes, then we can use this platform to promote it. And in fact, we want to even add the mechanism to connect those ones selected ones to, to, to investors. So that's the, I think we can talk a lot about how we can cooperate around this innovation sandbox since we are talking about, you know, uh, Silicon Valley. Secondly, I see the, you know, the Africa Health Tech Summit. For me, bringing people together, and that's the spirit of the Alliance, because once people get together, uh, there is no limit to how much they can, you know, innovate, what they can contribute and so on and so forth. And we want to build Africa's largest health tech gather, annual gathering. Um, and this is where I, I would like to partner with you guys also to make sure that all the good things that are being done, some of which are not even visible, they don't get the attention of the policymakers. They don't challenge uh, the, the, the governments and challenge the innovation community. I think we want to bring those to the fore and have the conversations that are going to help us align and accelerate. So that's the second one. And perhaps the third, I would say, um, uh, would be the capacity building that you and I <laughs> are the fathers of. Uh, I think uh, I want to tell the members that uh, your board member has given me sleepless nights. He challenged me, Martin, you challenged me, you flew from Nairobi. Uh, you you put me to task and ask me, like, I mean, this public health informatics fellowship does not really match this magnitude of the uh, digital health capacity demand. So how can we work together to increase the capacity available within the provider community, within the innovation community, within the policy making and leadership circles, but most importantly, even within the recipients of service, the demand at the very bottom of the pyramid. How do we think systematically and holistically about the capacity that is needed uh, to drive this transformation? And uh, I'm working with Martin and a number of uh, partners joining our uh, partner working group to design a solution to that. And then uh, different players will see where they want to contribute their, their expertise and resources. That's great. And just to note, the, the uh, flagship that you mentioned, the digital workforce development one, um, that's being led by PSI, and I'm sort of spearheading it from the PSI side, but I look at the Alliance as a critical partner um, of that, um, because a lot of Alliance members have interesting you know, capacity building tools and guidance that we could aggregate through the Alliance and actually use Africa CDC as the vehicle to, uh, to push it to member states. So governments have access um, um, uh, to those resources. Um, so 
any any uh, any any other area or any other call to action um, uh, for the alliance before I move on to Q and A? Anything else that we could we could be we could be doing to be useful um, uh, to Africa CDC? I think let's have a conversation. Uh, let's mm -hmm. let's talk. I think we have enough to get started on the three areas or the sixteen areas. Uh, I, I, I want to reiterate our invitation to the uh, Health uh, Tech Summit in October. I know many of the Alliance members have their African business units. Um, some of them, some of you don't have, but we, we want to invite you to be part of that conversation. Uh, you know, in, in Africa, the, 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 there is a say in my language that if you want to demonstrate that you are a friend of somebody, you be there in times of joy and times of sorrow. So that is a time of joy when the community meets in October. So we are going to see our partners by those who made the effort because we know it's a, it's a big effort to join, to make time. And we are going to be looking at those who were able to make it, but even to those who want to be able to make it, just uh, make sure that you registered uh, uh, your support. And then from there, all these flagships are going to come to life. So we are going to have a session around each one of these flagship initiatives. And uh, those interested in learning and knowing where they can play and contribute, you can join those conversations and then identify, you know, according to where each one has reached, what makes the most sense. So join us in October, and then uh, between now and October, very happy to continue the conversation on how we can also bring the work of the Alliance to the fore. Because after all, you know, Africa is a big part of global health. And I would say it's the way global health is the hardest uh, to, to, to achieve, the global health objectives. We can choose to start where it is easiest or choose to focus where it is the hardest and apply the lessons across or do both. But I'll invite you to join us in trying to do the hard thing. Thank you. And, and that challenge is accepted. Um, the Alliance already invests heavily in, in a presence in other um, uh, global forums and convenings, uh, such as the Global Digital Health Forum. So I think this year it would be interesting um, to have some kind of engagement um, um, uh, at the Africa uh, Health Tech Summit. So we only have five minutes left, and I'm going, going to give that time to the audience. So I'd like to kick off with Andy, uh, WHO. Um, he's got a question for you, Phil. Go ahead, Andy. Good to see you. Thanks. Good to see you again, Martin. Thanks for the invitation to be here today. And thanks also to Jean for the to Phil to the for the introduction to the CDC strategy. Very interesting. Count on WHO's support wherever we can. Um, please, we're part of that conversation. Just uh, let us know how to how to help. When I was listening to you, I was just wondering from a personal point of view, where do you think what what are you most excited about about this strategy? Or conversely, what are you most worried about? Um, and which part of the strategy do you strategy you think is going to have the biggest impact on public health and the reason i'm asking is wondering how the alliance can better support you in these key initiatives thank you uh first of all andy i want to say who is already on board i just got through our partners and looked for who and i see that uh, who colleagues are already participating in the flagship on digitization of primary care on the digital health index uh, on um, the health tech summit and on the capacity building, which is still loading. So we are we are we are in business here, and and thanks for your support. So I would say that um, uh, if you if you look at that uh, representation, they are sort of cross cutting, cross cutting pillars and vertical pillars. And I think the the, the cross cutting ones are the um, the enabling pillars. Um, so I would say that we would like to work with you, uh, with the members of the Alliance in, in putting up sort of the enabling environment for transformation. You tend to see things like infrastructure, innovation, data governance um, as, as part of the cross-cutting and then capacity. So I, I think if we can, you know, join our forces and think through the, the intervention that can have a catalytic 
a transformational impact on everything else. I think that's that's where I would I would see the the, the biggest uh, contribution. But again, uh, let me emphasize on innovation and data governance. And and also let me um, I think that brings to mind uh, a, a thought that came when I was having a conversation with Martin the other day, which is part of what Africa is suffering is is the perception or reality. You can tell me that Africa is being predated upon in terms of uh, data exploitation and data colonialism. And you know, Silicon Valley is cited often as the, cu the culprit for that. People have a sense like, oh my God, my data, I don't know where it is. And Google, you know, Meta, whatever, Amazon is sucking my data and have no, no say, no, no visibility of where the data that my phone collects or my account collects is is, and I think there is a, a an, an obligation to to come out and be transparent and say, hey, look, guys, this is what ha actually happens, and this is how we can work together to make sure that whatever data sovereignty makes sense, it happens. Whatever it doesn't make business sense, we, we have that conversation. So I'd like to to invite this community to uh, help us in improving the conversation around the issues of data sovereignty, of data colonialism, all these kind of things that people politicize when it is not necessary, but also be transparent and say, this is how as a group we can address the big concern of our partner. The other concern, which is perhaps not directly in line with the Alliance's mission is around uh, uh, the question of fiscal responsibility. Um, that uh, multinationals in the digital sector have. Uh, in Africa, the policymakers that I talked to in, during my time also as minister, I, I could feel a lot of frustration and helplessness around the fact that uh, policymakers don't know how to think about the fiscal responsibility of, uh, health, of, of big tech. And I know it's a conversation that has been there and it's a complicated one. And I, I'm, I was very much into all the conversations like OTT you know, versus telecom and so on and so forth. Uh, but if there is a way we can have you know, a conversation, at least focus it and narrow it to digital health, I'm not really in, interested in, in anything else for now, digital health and how we look and address the concern of uh, fiscal and tax accountability. I think even the conversation would be a good starting point because most of the companies don't have like an office in every country for understandable reasons. And when those countries want to engage, they don't know who to talk to, which to knock at. So I think Africa CDC and the Alliance can build a platform that allows for such a conversation to take place and that can go a long way strengthening the trust that is necessary for us to work together. Okay, great. So um, Andy, does that work? All right, awesome. So unfortunately we are out of time, um, but I'm going to steal one more minute um, uh, from the main session, just to get one more question from the room. Um, uh, yes. Uh, there are a couple of questions in, in the chat box. Uh, I see a question from Alexandra around ah. what will be Africa CDC's stance concerning using existing digital public goods versus developing local proprietary solutions for digital health systems uh, like EMRs. So in our strategy, we clearly recommend our member states to use digital public goods and adopting a digital public infrastructure approach whenever possible. Uh, it's, a, it's a choice we made. We are, we, we, we are not picking open source versus a proprietary, source, uh, proprietary software because we know you can build uh, digital public goods uh, on top of uh, any of the two, uh, as long as the solution uh, checks a number of boxes as being a, a, a serving the public good, the public interest. For me, that's the most important thing. Does it serve public interest? And, if, and how does it balance public interest versus uh, private interest? 
Uh, but I'm not here to define what a public good is and what a proprietary good is. I'm not a specialist on, on those questions. But I, 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 I would say that we, we recognize that the, the, in the end, the landscape will have both uh, public, uh, open, proprietary, but we, we highly encourage for, for many reasons, for affordability reasons, for local capacity building uh, purposes, for, uh, uh, for growing our own health tech innovation ecosystem. If any type of solution, be it proprietary or uh, public good, checks those marks, for me, I have no religious uh, inclination to say, I don't talk to these guys because they are not, you know, they are not into the digital public good uh, approach. All right, awesome. So Phil, I'm really sorry to cut you short. Um, this conversation should have taken three hours. We should have had a workshop rather than a, a fireside chat. Um, but it is really great to have you. Thank you for taking the time um, to speak with us. And it's the start of the conversation. Um, so yeah, you will be hearing a lot more from the Alliance. And um, for the Alliance members, if you've got any questions for Phil, because I see there's some questions still coming in, feel free to send them through to the Secretariat and um, we'll find a way of channeling them back uh, to you. But thank you so much, Phil, for taking your time and it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thanks everyone for having me. I'm already in touch with Barry. We're going to continue the conversation offline. And if there are any questions that I was not able to pay attention to in the chat box, please do convey. Let me type my email address before I go. Um, this is the panel of other possibilities for AI, artificial intelligence in global health. My name is Krista Donaldson. I am most importantly a board member of the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. I'm also at Stanford Biodesign, the director of Innovation Impact. Um, I'm going to ask our amazing panelists today. Natasha is next to me. Our other panelists, Paul, Caroline, and Brittany are joining us remotely, but I'm going to ask them to rapid fire introduce themselves, where they're from, and how their work is connected to AI. So Natasha, let's start with you. Sure, um, is this working? Yeah. Perfect. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, so nice to see so many familiar faces. For those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Natasha Sunderji. I am the global health and nutrition lead for Accenture's social impact practice, which is called Accenture Development Partnerships. It's essentially the group in the big, massive consulting firm of Accenture that focuses on underserved communities, both domestically and globally. Now Accenture being 730,000 plus people is the largest digital consultancy in the world. So you can imagine that through that role, we've had the great opportunity to work on some of the most leading edge uh, technology applications that use artificial intelligence. Great, Paul, let's go to you. Hi, everybody. My name is Paul Musser. I work at MasterCard. I manage for MasterCard our global corporate health customers. So those are firms that uh, operate in multiple regions around the world. Many of them are pharma and med tech firms, um, the wholesaler and distribution community that service them, and of course, all the clinical trial and other research organizations that make medicine possible. Great, and Carolina. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. I'm Carolina Batista. I'm a physician. I'm originally from Brazil. I'm clinically trained there. And then all of my other training was uh, abroad, but I'm currently in Morocco. So I hope you can, you can hear me mm -hmm. okay. And I'm the, the head of global health affairs at Baraka Impact Finance. And after working for almost 20 years in um, settings such as conflict zones with doctors without borders and, and doing a lot of research on tropical diseases with GNGI, Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. I'm now working with Baraka and, and our intention, our vision is really to provide innovative finance solutions for health in emerging markets by connecting private investors, uh, private foundations and different sources of, of uh, private investments with health entrepreneurs uh, that are creating and scaling solutions uh, for the most underserved and also uh, for the population living in emerging um, countries. And then, you know, a lot of them, of course, are working on, on digitally uh, based solutions and, and a lot of them AI. So I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to be with you all. And last but not least, Brittany, thank you. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Brittany Hume Charm, uh, and I'm joining you from Boston. Uh, I'm with uh, Pendulum Systems, which is formerly known as MacroEyes. Uh, and uh, we actually are an AI and machine learning company. So we provide AI driven supply chain optimization solutions um, across a number of industries that predict demand, optimize supply, and improve on their own. Um, and in global health, we have worked across about a dozen. Um, LMICs um, to help them make the most of the resources that they have today so that they can be expanding health access and doing more with um, the resources that they already have. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. All right. Um, artificial intelligence has never been more prominent and profoundly transformative in the way healthcare is delivered. From disease surveillance to diagnostics, from clinical trials to medical training to treatment, from supply chains, as we're hearing, to workforce shortages, AI-driven health tools are having a real-world impact at unprecedented scale. In global health and emerging markets, AI is already tackling complex health challenges. And in some cases, AI is helping LMICs leapfrog higher income regions in addressing wicked problems and improving health outcomes. Today, we are going to explore some of the other areas where AI can improve health. Finance, as you've heard, consumer insights, and some of these other less explored areas. So while AI tools are having an incredible impact, we know it is not a panacea for all issues. And we, I think all of us who have kids are knowing that with chat GPT <laughs> and hearing about all of that. <laughs> um, but these technological advancements can also reveal a very real digital divide. It can reveal insufficient funding and inadequate infrastructure. Moreover, AI requires co-design, intentional inclusivity built for equitable access, we must consider privacy, security, proper governance, and appropriate regulatory systems. Otherwise, the dystopian dangers are very real. Today, though, we are bringing together Alliance members to talk about AI and the implications surrounding their work. We want to learn what they're excited about, um, as well as what keeps them up at night. Um, our panelists are not engineering experts from the tech firms, um, but a cross-section of organizations exploring and and experimenting with AI's potential. So today will not be a survey course in AI. I feel like you all have had that already, but we hope it'll introduce some thought provoking and potentials for all of you and your organizations. So with that, I'm gonna kick it off with Natasha, again, who's here with me in person, um, because she's been studying this for years. And um, Natasha, I'm gonna get you to say a little bit more about that, but, um, could you provide us some framing and also maybe talk about what you're excited about and also what concerns you have? Sure. Um, so the education piece that um, she was just referring to is some of the work that I did with the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development back in 2020. Now, the Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development has a digital health working group through which they develop thought leadership that can help to support country governments as they try to advance their work in digital health. So back in 2018, we wrote about digital health and the ways it could be used to advance universal health coverage and support NCD care. In 2020, we wrote about the role of artificial intelligence in global health and created an AI maturity roadmap for country governments to help them understand where they need to make investments today to take advantage of technologies tomorrow. And then most recently, we wrote a report on virtual health and care and looked at what happened over the pandemic um, and who's benefiting from these kind of digital technologies, who we're leaving behind, as you rightly pointed out. And again, how we can create a more inclusive digital ecosystem through which everyone can benefit. So to your question around what excites me the most, being a person that works in global health, it's just the sheer volume of use cases that are emerging for artificial intelligence in the global health space. So in that report, uh, we talked about five big use cases. So the first being population health, the second being uh, preclinical research and clinical trials, the third being clinical care, the fourth being those uh, patient-facing solutions that we are all too familiar with, and then last but not least, um, the ways in which artificial intelligence can be used to optimize healthcare operations. So population health management, these are the predictive analytic solutions that are helping us to better understand human health and to better target public health interventions. So the greatest example we've all heard here is Blue Dot. This is the company 
that recognize that unusual cluster of unusual pneumonia cases in Wuhan, China in late 2019, before any of us were talking about COVID-19 or any of us knew of this global pandemic that would ensue. Artificial intelligence was behind that. From a preclinical research and clinical trials perspective, we're seeing artificial intelligence being used to help drive drug discovery. So it takes about $2 billion to bring a drug to market. With artificial intelligence, we're able to better understand diseases and therefore better target compounds so we can bring drugs to market faster and cheaper. And then in the clinical care space, these are the new tools in artificial intelligence that are helping us to better understand and diagnose um, those that are helping us to better translate uh, physician conversations, those that are even helping us from a precision medicine perspective. So you've probably seen the headlines around how artificial intelligence is helping us to better diagnose the exact kind of cancer and therefore have more targeted treatments. That's all in the clinical care perspective. From a patient-facing solutions perspective, I'm sure every single person in the room, as well as those of us joining online, can name at least one chatbot that you've seen out there that's helping to interact with patients and helping them to not only understand their health, but get more information around how they can better care for themselves. And then last but not least, healthcare optimization. This is all the stuff that's happening to streamline our backend processes, whether we're talking about procurement, logistics, staff scheduling, emergency dispatch. When you hear a lot of the headlines here in the US around the savings that we can get in the healthcare ecosystem through artificial intelligence, they largely sit in that bucket. So, so many different exciting opportunities in artificial intelligence in healthcare. And so what keeps you up at night? Oh my God. <laughs> what the main me, ones, how about the main ones? The, the ones top are keeps, two or three. Yeah, no, the big thing that keeps me up at night is the same thing you mentioned, is that with every single technology advancement we've seen in human history, not everyone benefits equally. And so while low and middle income countries may have the most to gain from making the investments that allow us to take advantage of artificial intelligence, they also have the most to lose if they're not making the right investments. There was a great Lancet commission that talked about how digital is the new determinant of health and how weak governance of digital technologies is creating health inequities. And it's even challenging our ability to drive robust human rights. And so if we're not smart about the investments we're making, um, to piggyback off of one of the great points that our, our keynote uh, speaker said around connectivity, first and foremost, making sure that we are expanding connectivity to more rural communities, to underserved communities, so it's not only accessible, but also affordable, we're never going to be able to take advantage of artificial intelligence. And then when it comes to the country governments that are often behind creating these robust digital architectures and ecosystems through which artificial intelligence solutions can thrive, we talk about various building blocks in this report, the biggest three of which are the people and workforce that are needed to drive these kind of solutions at scale and with sustainability, to the data and technology elements, which I'm sure many of my co-panelists are going to speak to the challenges around data privacy, data security, having robust, quality, unbiased data. And then last but not least, the governance and regulation that's needed. The technology has far surpassed our regulations. And so we really need to work together as a global community to get back on track. And I appreciate just these themes of, again, a collaboration and co-design that I feel like you're pulling through with Jean Philbert from our, our keynote this morning. So thank you. Um, Paul, let's turn to you. Um, and sorry, I'm going to look behind my, myself <laughs> here. Um, uh, I know at MasterCard, you've been doing some really exciting work um, with behavior insights in AI as it's related to health treatment. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that and how that translates to patient care. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think. I think the points that Natasha's made are really important and need to be reinforced over and over again. And that is from our own experience, having been involved in financial inclusion for a decade and a half, we know really well that what seems to work in you know, Nashville, Tennessee is not gonna work in Nigeria. And and so the sense of localization of the effort is really critical in understanding that community. And those of you that have worked with us know that MasterCard is a, a digital infrastructure company. And, and so we can talk and wax poetic about all the great things that digital can bring, 
But we know all so well that at the end of the day, if it isn't culturally relevant, if it doesn't reflect the economic capabilities of the community, it isn't. It, it just simply doesn't work. And the perfect example is um, connectivity. Connectivity seems to be easy. And even if you can make the connection, is the, the next question should be, is it affordable? In our cases, when it comes to healthcare, what we're thinking about is the experience of that patient as they walk out of the clinic door, after they've had the conversation with their physician, after the physician has shared the treatment plan and made sure they understand what needs to be done, how do we help them help both the physician and the patient, but in particular the patient, make sure they execute that treatment plan? Because the great medicine that's being done in the clinic needs to follow that patient on the outside door. And, and fundamental to that is our belief that with a nuanced, culturally nuanced, uh, ethnographically nuanced, right time, right place, right message, you can help that patient be successful. And so we think AI has a lot of capabilities in this space, understanding that Paul, when he's in the outskirts of Nairobi, isn't going to be able to use a data heavy device. Maybe it's just giving him a voice call. Whereas potentially the next patient is able to afford data. And so maybe you provide a web, web based solution. But regardless of that, it goes back to that fundamentals. How do I get the right message at the right time through the right channel? And that is an experience that takes lots of nuance expertise in the training of those models that AI then can help you target, AI can help you deliver. I have to say, as someone who works in design, the power of better understanding users and their own context is incredibly exciting. So Paul, this is really <laughs> fantastic. Um, Carolina, let's turn to you um, as a global health physician who has worked in the sector for over two decades. You're now working in finance with Baraka Impact Finance, um, designing financial solutions. <laughs> so where do you think key investments are needed to improve data infrastructure? We heard a little bit about this with Natasha, interoperability and data literacy for AI use in healthcare, particularly in emerging markets. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think, again, not enough to, to stress what has been said before. I think the co-design, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. And I've, I've worked a lot with communities, you know, in different settings, like rural areas in Africa or rural areas in, in uh, Latin America. And then of course, what works for them will not work for a type of population that lives in, in a different place. So I think AI, for me, I, I will use an analogy, but I think it's really the analogy is, you know, data is the fuel for AI, for successful AI initiative in any source, especially in health. And I think that without data, AI will not function or, or improve health outcomes for, for populations and including uh, more, more importantly, populations in, in, in emerging markets or the, the more traditionally underserved. So, but again, it's not as any fuel, it's not only about the quantity, but it's also about the quality, the security, the, the, the reliability of, of that of that type of fuel and that structure so that all of that can be uh, very successfully translated into information so that it can inform um, unbiased uh, clinical decisions, uh, clinical decision support tools, and, and, and all of those uh, amazing uh, tools that have been developed now and we see coming from, from those contexts. So I think also um, in, in, in terms of, of um, having tailored solutions, context tailored solutions, I think it's really important to provide support uh, in the form not only of, of, of financial investments, but also uh, building the data literacy that's that's needed, that's urgently needed in those contexts, because even if you have a tool that can be, let's say, applied or implemented in, 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 in emerging markets or low middle income countries, uh, if the workforce is not trained enough, uh, to to adopt and and uptake that uh, in a in a successful way in a way that's friendly to use etc. Then you know it's going to be uh, yeah a solution that's that's just a potential but not really uh, an implementation. So I think really uh, thinking I, I would say like thinking three main 
streams of, of investments would be really to invest in the, the digital infrastructure that's needed. And that includes not only the physical uh, infrastructure, but also the, the, the technical, the human resources infrastructure that will enable the, the successful and, and, and uh, effective collection, storage, management, analysis of data, and really also investing in, in the data inter interoperability, because you know I was recently with the, the Baraka team in, in Geneva at the World Health Assembly, and a lot was said about uh, interoperability of data. So in a lot of the countries, and I'm here now in Morocco for, for this field trip, you know, still have a lot of data, uh, health data that's on paper, and, and, and a lot of new initiatives that are uh, digital and, and are using a good data uh, collection, but then they don't talk to, for example, uh, information or data sources or, or, or <laughs> Uh, tools that are from economics, uh, the economic department, the education department. So I really think building those bridges and, and you cannot stress enough the, the, the importance of collaboration, of partnerships at the local level, of bringing people to talk to each other and really the, the different sectors and the multi-sectoral approach that will inevitably be able to demonstrate to investors uh, the 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 impact and and the value of of investing in AI and and data collections in emerging markets so that they can see how that uh, translates into um, improved health outcomes, save lives of course, but then also uh, improve the, the 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 society and the communities uh, more broadly. So really, as a way to achieve the uh, sustainable development goals and 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 all of that. So I think bringing uh, we have a lot of solutions, for example, that we work with, and one of them is a, a mammography service from, from Argentina that they're uh, active in, and both in Argentina and Mexico, they're mammo test. And it's really a great example, for example, of, of uh, you know, bringing that uh, uh, remote uh, mammography program to women who had otherwise not, have never had access to, to a mammogram before, but also how they're working with an AI uh, company from Germany to build the very much needed uh, clinical data and specificity for those types of populations who have been historically underrepresented uh, in clinical trials or uh, all of these algorithms for better outcomes. So there are a lot of great examples out there. I think it's really being able to demonstrate the value so that investors can see that with you know not only the, 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 the quantitative impact, but also the qualitative uh, impact of those solutions. So that keeps me up at night, but also <laughs> makes me uh, wake up every morning with a lot of uh, you know excitement and, and and really seeing how uh, those those uh, localized solutions are so uh, important and, and should be de definitely uh, supported. Let me. I, I really appreciate that you brought an example in because uh, you know it helps. I think those of us who are still understanding some of these implications more come to life. But let me ask you a quick follow up, Carolina. Um, how do you like? How will we bring more investment in? How do we catalyze investors? So this this is the question that really keeps me up at night sometimes. Not all, not all here, right? Safely, yes. But I think that's that's really the power of creating the right um, impact narrative of how you know we have a lot of examples. And I brought the example of mammo test in Latin America. You know, bridging the divide between the women who have access to mammograms and the women who have not uh, had access, and how that is you know not only improving the the the, the health outcomes, but also you know, if you if a woman in this rural area uh, dies of breast cancer because she had not she had not accessed uh, in a timely manner uh, diagnostics and diagnostics and care, the whole family is, is impacted, right? So I think building with the communities and with the providers those types of stories and those types of narratives that combine both the quantitative but all, also the, the qualitative, I think it's key and and and. As we always say at Baraka, we're building the airplane as we're flying it in many ways, because I think for other areas of uh, you know, impact ESG investments, you have very clear metrics and you know, the carbon footprint and this and that, but for health, it's, it's, it's hard to quantify. So I think bringing those stories and, and really showing how from a provider perspective, and I speak for myself as a physician, how uh, you know many many times when I was working with doctors without borders in a remote area or in a refugee camp or in a conflict zone, I would be up at night thinking I don't have the right tools. And now we have them. We have them in some parts of the world. And I think we've we've had enough experiences in the past with the HIV crisis and even with COVID. How 
you know, we have leapfrog of, of technology and, and, and availability of new tools, but then we fail in the access. So I think that's really what should be, be, be brought into to light is really the accessibility, the affordability, the quality and the equity of these tools and, and for, for any tool, especially for AI tools, so they can be, they can bridge the gap and not widen the, the, the gap between equity. And I love what you said, intentional inclusivity. So I think that's really a key. Sorry, if you don't mind me building on that great point, Carolina. Um, I think that there's something really critical that we need to unpack here when it comes to bringing in greater investment for digital health, artificial intelligence, regardless. In many cases, we are using these technologies as a means to replace or augment what would be a face-to-face -face interaction. And what we lack today is a lot of the quantitative data that shows that the outcomes that we can achieve are comparable or if not better. And I really have to call out Dr. Somia from or formerly with the WHO for putting pressure on a lot of the organizations that are driving digital health solutions um, and even on, in a lot of the thought leadership that we've co-written together to really push for greater investment in the space. Because yes, the, the qualitative stories are certainly powerful and can, emoke, uh, can invoke an emotional response in paying attention, straightening up and, and listening a little closer, but it's the quantitative data that actually shows that we can move the needle in patient outcomes. It's the quantitative data that actually shows that we are able to access patients that we couldn't access before that's actually going to move the needle in a more meaningful way and drive the kind of reallocation of investment that I think is needed here. We need good quantitative data. Yes. yes. <laughs> Which I think we've all been in that boat. Um, thank you for that. And um, Brittany, let's turn to you. Brittany is our um, sole panel panelist who is at an AI company. She's also um, a global health innovator. She was formerly with Zipline, now at Pendulum. So Brittany, I want you to tell us what you're excited about with AI and innovation um, in, the, in, the, in solving global health problems. Yes, and thank you so much for having me. Hello, everyone. I wish I were able to see your faces in person, um, but great to be here remotely. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I know that AI is sort of all things to all people, but, you know, for, um, for me, the thing that is most exciting about this technology is the efficiency and productivity that it can unlock. Um, and so, you know, there's, right now, there's just a huge leak of resources that is happening in global health from suboptimal allocation. And that's of products or of people. And you know, I think that unfortunately we, you know, we put up with a lot of that, you know, error. Um, it's sort of an allocation error, right? Where you have stockouts or you know a shortage of people on one hand, or you have um, uh, expiring products or overstaffing on another. Um, and that is, you know, we're just doing the best we can because we think that understanding how to, you know, target our, um, our time and our resources is something that we just don't have visibility to now, but with AI, we actually do. Um, and so imagine what we could do if every dollar or dose or health worker was put to use in such a way that it could have its greatest potential impact. Uh, we could do so much more with the resources that already exist, and we could, to this point about investment, we could make much more powerful arguments for bringing more resources to bear um, in global health. If we could show that we know where to put those resources so that they will absolutely be used and be expanding the size of the pie. Um, so... You know, as I said, there are many kinds of AI, um, but at Pendulum, we really, uh, the core of our technology is on intelligent um, prediction and optimization. Um, and I'll kind of pick on another word that has come up already, which is targeting, right? So when you're optimizing, it's you're figuring out how do I target what I have today to the, the people or the location where it can be put to best use. Um, and that's and that's an optimization problem that actually AI and machine learning is really good at doing. Um, so, you know, what um, the other thing is that those tools are continuously learning and improving. And that is, again, the machine learning part of it. Once you establish these data pipelines, um, then they can actually learn from what 
happens in the real world on an ongoing basis. And in supply chains, there's a lot of data that's moving back and forth about you know, what's being sent where. Um, and so these are very rich, um, active, dynamic data pipelines that where you can learn very quickly um, and continue to, um, to have your algorithms improve over time. Um, so, you know, what data are you, or what demand are you likely to experience at every different point of your network, you know, in a, in a health system, at every health facility across, across the country, um, you know, every day, week, month, and, you know, what resources are you going to need where in order to be optimally prepared for that? Um, you know, this, this prediction and optimization is really around efficiency and doing more with less. And that I think is about as uncontroversial as you can get. Um, so, you know, adoption of, of these tools, I think is going to be inevitable across the private sector. It already is happening across the private sector and in supply chains, um, it is, it, it's, it's like wildfire because there is so much efficiency to be gained. And I think everyone has seen over the last few years, you know, the result of uh, what happens when supply chains break down. Um, and so the the opportunity to be using this technology to improve supply chains um, uh, in every industry, including global health, um, I think is imperative. Um, I think there's there's really no, you know, I I personally would be um, would be you know very upset if if global health didn't um, actually seize this opportunity when when every other industry will. Yeah, and I think what um, picking up on your point around these inefficiencies is what's so exciting about that is focusing on patient care, which again, picking up on some of the remarks earlier by Jean Philbert and some of the, the themes that you were seeing with your research. Um, I know we're running out of time, so I wanna check, do we have time for questions? We do, okay, great. So I think Lisa's gonna help with that. And then just so you know, after a few questions, I'm gonna do a rapid speed round with our panelists to wrap up. So just warning guys. <laughs> All right, any questions? Oh, okay, great. So will he pop up? Hi, everyone. Oh, great. Okay, oh. I hear a voice. There we go. We have um, Professor Netneel Shimalash from University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. He is now at Stanford. Um, but uh, do you have a question for us? Or for our panel. Yes, yes, yes. Um, thank you very much for the invitation and for an, a very enthralling conversation you guys have had. Um, <clears throat> so given my background, I'm very much interested on the equity, health equity side of um, AI and global health. Um, so this is something you've all touched up on uh, to a certain level. And um, so biases um, in the data sets, uh, AI systems are used and the accessibility of the products has been a heated subject in the AI mm. uh, and global health conversation. Um, how my question is, um, how can we ensure that um, AI technologies are developed uh, and deployed in a manner that avoids reinforcing existing uh, inequalities, um, respects cultural diversity, and promotes inclusive access to healthcare services in, in, glo in the global scale? Um, I see this as an opportunity for us to to revise our, our currently existing systems and how can we do that? Um, in your opinion, and this is this question goes to everyone, uh, what specific steps can be taken to address um, the already existing biases and algorithms um, used in global health, um, such as diagnostics? Uh, we've all heard of some of the stories mm -hmm. then. Um, and treatment treatment recommendations for specific populations uh, in order to assure equity um, and accuracy across different populations. Thank you. Does anyone want to jump yeah. in with that? I think there's probably something for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you're laughing, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go to you first. I, I'm laughing because there's a lot in that question. <laughs> um, that's why I, that's why it's Grady asked it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think my take is if you start where Natasha start, uh, started us and Brittany then followed, which was you take the assets, the experience in the local market and you optimize for it. And the person who can do that best is the physician or the hospital director or whomever is there. They know their community. They know the resources they have and they feel the pain 
of not being able to treat that one additional patient. And as a result of that, if we can empower them through tools that we bring from the geo north, for example, but are available to them to develop a solution, you know, whether it's Carolina's group getting an investment for a startup in Nairobi to take and build something that's local, that I believe is going to be your best chance. If you simply rely on the export of something from my offices in London or New York into Nairobi, th that is not going to solve the problem. It's got to take the local folks who understand the local market and empowering them to build something for the local community. That, I believe, is the way that you make sure that it's nuanced to them, respectful of them, and importantly, allows others to build upon that success from that local community. That would be my, my take on it. Great. Natasha? Sure. So there isn't a single country in the world that doesn't have biases in the data that they're using yeah. to drive artificial intelligence solutions. Let's face it. What it comes down to, though, is smart data science understanding how to unpack the data that you have to understand the gaps that exist and how to fill them. So for example, um, in the preclinical research space, we've seen in the US massive gaps when it comes to the data that we're using in clinical research. We're basically doing clinical research on white middle-aged men. So we're currently working with a couple of um, big organizations in the US to genomically sequence 500,000 individuals of African-American descent, starting there because we know once we bring in that data, we can start to train our AI uh, algorithms on data that is more representative of the population. And so to me, it comes down to understanding the data that you have today understanding how it's biased and finding creative solutions to fill those data gaps. It might not be going to the facility that you're relying on for your data, but actually going to the community to actually access the patients where they are. Thanks for that. And Carolina or Brittany? Yes, I, maybe I would like to build on that. And I think this is a, a great cash question. Thank you, Nathaniel. Um, you know, we have a lot of experiences, uh, for example, of companies who we work with that are building um, clinical decision support tools, for example, using AI and using really um, context tailored solutions. Like they have a smartphone, but then it works on the data collection aspect offline, for example. And this is, I'm thinking of ThinkMD, and we have others uh, that are really working on training and expanding access to uh, clinical decision support tools to, to providers to community health workers uh, in very hard to reach areas, which otherwise would not have any any access to, to, to the clinical care they're providing. But also not only that, I think there is such a value. And, and I, again, going back to the, to, the, to the beauty of building the quantitative plus the quantitative uh, uh, approach to, to this type of information is really uh, they're, they're building big uh, data sources of, of, of populations who are historically underrepresented in the clinical trials, but also I think we all saw now how uh, badly prepared we were in terms of pandemic, of, of reaction, reaction to, to, to you know, epidemic threats, et cetera. So having access to that type of data, or, you know, and investing in, in companies that are doing that type of work on the ground, close to populations who are, you know, living in contexts where health systems are very weak and could not, uh, successfully respond, for example, for an outbreak, for an epidemic threat, this will really build a very robust, uh, comprehensive data set that can be used uh, for gu guiding clinical trials, guiding, uh, guiding uh, research uh, approaches, but also, I think, uh, building of warning systems. Why not, right? Like if you have then after a while some sort of algorithm that will identify, oh, maybe this is a, I don't know, malaria outbreak because we're starting to see fever, et cetera. So really making that, those types of questions and, and building the algorithms that will benefit these populations, I think it's key. And, and again, these solutions are coming from the ground and, and will not come from where we're sitting in, 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 in the global north, but really understanding and help, helping uh, the, the providers on the ground to build uh, the most uh, tailored and, and context-specific tools. 
Wonderful, thanks. And Brittany? Maybe I'll just add a, a quick point or two because um, I know that we're um, we're short on time. But you know, I think when when we think about um, uh, you know equity and I, mean, I think really when we're um, when when we're thinking about building out these um, these systems, I think we have to be very cognizant of I think what what Paul has also said, um, which is you know what is the um, what is what is the existing data? Um, so how do we, you know, understand these are not perfect data systems? How do we be, you know, cognizant um, of, of building AI solutions that are appropriate and robust for the kinds of customers that you're working with and for then where they are using those systems? Um, and I would actually build on one other point that um, that Natasha was making, which is about you know, re replacing or augmenting a face-to-face -face interaction, I and I would kind of shift that to being a, more around decision support, which is something that you were saying, Carolina, um, which is, you know, we are, we are recognizing that health workers are short-staffed. Um, and so how can you be helping that health worker who does know their patient population the best, be empowering them to be able to take the data that exists in their system and support their decision to say, of all of these patients in this waiting room, you should actually be spending your time on those three while they're here, because those are the ones that are really gonna move the needle if you have that, that interaction and, and follow up with them so that they're not lost to follow up. So it's, I think that this is a bit of a scattered answer, but it's, it's like understanding, yes, what the quality and quantity of the data is, and then making sure that you are empowering the people who are in that system to be using their own expertise um, so that that is helping them make the best decision that they can. Thank you. And, and Net Neil, thank you so much for the question as well. So we're going to wrap up. Oh, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, we do. Oh, we do. Okay, great. Thank you. We have one online and then we have one here in the room. And we actually have two in the room. So I'm going to let That's you decide okay. how you want to do it. <laughs> Not me. If this works. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Joe Novotny. I'm from UCSF. Um, I'll try to keep it quick. You all mentioned good ac access to good quality data. We've seen an increase in data protection laws, especially in LMIC <laughs> countries. Um, then there's a heightened sensitivity around personal health data. Uh, mm -hmm. With a novel and evolving technology like AI, uh, what's been your experience with uh, data protection and global health, um, and what do you see as the future issues coming forward? Yeah, Natasha, why don't we go to you on that one? Yeah, <laughs> she said, of course, in case you didn't hear that. <laughs> well, it's, it's a very difficult one, um, because when it comes to data protection, it, it goes back to something I said earlier, which is our regulations and policies around a lot of these things haven't kept up with the technology yeah. itself. And if you look at a lot of the policymakers, bless their heart, they're trying to do the best they possibly can. But so many of the skill sets around data, digital, artificial intelligence sit in the private sector. We can pay more. We therefore are contributing to the brain drain that inevitably happens when it comes to developing robust policies around this. So I would say that the future of data protection is better collaboration with policymakers to help to drive better policies around this and not just taking the policies that are developed in the global north and applying them in the global south because that's where in the past we've made some big mistakes and Brittany, i'm going to put you on the hot on the seat here too i wonder if you have a perspective from an ai company yeah absolutely i mean i think you know first of all making sure that you're working with a reputable partner is really important. Um, so make sure that you're, you know, working with a company that has been investing in their, in their, um, in all of their security measures. Um, and that's, you know, particularly being able to work in like HIPAA compliant, um, or the equivalent, right. With, with data. So like, that's just a, I think that's a, um, a starting point, right. That should be the, the entry point to being able to have a partner there. Um, I also think, you know, uh, this point about interoperability came up before. Um, how can you actually be able to layer on AI solutions on top of the existing platforms that already exist that these health systems are already using um, so that the, the data can actually stay um, with them uh, and you can be uh, hmm. um, 
being able to just create integrations um, with those data platforms uh, and be able to keep all of the core data um, inside their system. I think that's um, another solution that, that we think is really important so that you can say, this is your data. Uh, and we're actually just making your own system be able to be not only um, intelligent um, and have insights, but actually have foresight um, and make recommendations on top of it. So um, looking for something like that, where it's not, you know, taking all of your data um, and then wondering where it's going. Give it back. Great. And Paul or Carolina? I was, just gonna say, I was just gonna say it's all about talent, right? The talent exists. It's up to us to make sure that there's investments in that talent so that they can write policy procedures nuanced to the community in which it's operating, right? Policy, the HIPAA standards in the US is not gonna work in Sub-Saharan Africa. It just doesn't make sense. But that doesn't mean that we can't invest in the people who can write those policies that make sense for those communities. It, it, the talent exists. We just need to invest in it. Yeah, I think I, I think that's a that's a great point, and I think also you know we've, we've been discussing a lot you know internally, but also at the, in Geneva now for the World Health Assembly, there was a lot of conversations about the cost of, of inaction, right? And I think we we cannot afford uh, to 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 pay so much for not acting on a timely manner on that, and and I think it builds up you know the talent. Uh, there are very talented people in many, many places, in, in different places, from different areas, right? Data, engineering, um, health, mm. uh, education. And, and we see more and more like people wanting to go back to their countries. And, and a lot of the founders we work with at Barack and work with over 200 of them, there are people who are trained in the best institutions of the world and they decide to go back to India, to Africa, to Latin America, because they simply, don't accept the fact that their population should have substandard uh, quality of care, for example. So they're building, you know, a lot of, of, uh, of amazing tools, digital tools, AI tools that will improve the health of that population, but they need to be supported. They need to not only have the investments for their solution so that they can scale and reach more people, but also there needs to be investments in the infrastructure for innovation. So we need to invest in the innovation ecosystem so that there, people can also have the chance to make it right and try it on error, but then we have to very well uh, uh, tell uh, the stories through quality, through data, through quantity, uh, like how these solutions are impacting uh, people's lives. So it's really, we, we cannot afford another, uh, you know, it, a high cost for, for inaction. Uh, and we have the chance now to do it right. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go to our last question. I know there's other questions, so I'm gonna encourage you to find our panelists after both remotely and Natasha's here. Um, but let's go to Steph and Steph, if you could probably introduce yourself before asking your question, please. This is Steph Bertolzi, I'm at UC Berkeley and I'm on the board of the Alliance. And I'm not gonna ask a question, I'm just gonna make a quick comment. Fair. I agree with what everyone has said about the equity implications, about the biases that are built in, about our need to be sensitive to that. And, I think we're sending the wrong message mm. because the implicit message that we're sending is that these tools make inequity worse. And I don't think that's true. I was in Kinshasa when the internet happened. All of a sudden, we, with this flip of a switch, had access to the Harvard Medical Library in Kinshasa. The people in Harvard already had access to the Harvard Medical Library. The benefits accrued disproportionately to people who didn't have access. My mother, was able to have doctors come to her when she was sick. She benefited from having telemedicine, but she didn't get better access because of it. The people who disproportionately benefit from some of these tools are from the people who don't have access. Right now with ChatGPT, my students in Mexico have copy editing of their manuscripts. It matters more to them than it does to the students I have at Berkeley who already write pretty well. So I think that it's really important that as we are concerned about these implications for equity, that we don't assume that the, that the benefits accrue disproportionately to those people who already have access. Because unlike immunotherapy for cancer, the benefits here don't just accrue to the top of the distribution, they can accrue more to the bottom. And I just think mm -hmm. it's really important that we don't send the message out there that this is bad for equity. I think, yeah, I think that's a very good point and we have a challenge. So I, I actually agree with you for the most part. 
Um, because I, I do believe that when the internet happened, there were a whole slew of people that gained access to it. I think the messaging is, is a little bit more nuanced though, because when the internet happens, there are still huge swaths of the population that don't have connectivity and it's those that we're leaving behind. So it, it's, it's not that we're saying that the benefits disproportionately accrue to one set of the population. The benefits are mixed across um, the entire socioeconomic pyramid. And what we're saying is, as you get excited about these shiny, sexy AI tools, don't forget about those that are at the true base of the pyramid that do not have connectivity, that regardless of what exciting solution you create, you will leave behind. And so are there creative ways that you can bring them into your solution so that they can have the benefits that you're talking about? And I think what I'm hearing is mindful design and co-design and ensuring that you're thinking about equity from the very beginning so that we can maximize equity and access to all of these incredible tools and all this incredible work. Um, I am going to do this very rapid fire because I think for all of you sitting in the room, and I know for myself, it's like, can AI play a role in the work my organization is doing? So I'm going to start with Brittany on this one, but I'm going to ask all our panelists to just very quickly say... Um, how like how can organizations who are less familiar with AI, how can they start thinking about possibly using AI with their own work? And I know we've got Fischl Foundation, we've got Research, we've got all these incredible organizations doing this work who may or may not have thought about using AI in their work. So this is going to be very rapid fire. And Brittany, I'm going to start with you, please. Sure, absolutely. Um, and before I answer, I'll just say, Steph, I totally agree with you um, just on the, on the equity point. So. You know, we know that stockouts affect the smallest and more remote facilities the most, um, and that you know, it, as we're able to actually have these solutions um, work, it's actually increasing access in some of the places that um, have traditionally suffered from the inequity. So anyway, um, but yes, um, as you're thinking about um, how to you know, how AI might be relevant for you, three quick points. First is um, I would think about what your scarcest resource is. Um, across your system is that um, is that people um, is it um, is it products is it money um, and how do you think about um, understanding how to use AI to better target that resource um, so um, I would start there um, and you know you could potentially be able to unlock you know ten percent forty percent two hundred percent more impact. Um, for that scarce resource, and if you're targeting that, um, that's um, that's really the the uh, constraint, then you can be unlocking you know impact um, for your whole your whole system and all of your work. The second piece is um, I would just say the fallacy of thinking that you need perfect data to get started, um, like huge perfect data mm. sets to get started. Um, I, we hear that all the time. I think that is just untrue. Um, you can get started. Um, AI can bring in many different data sets that may be public um, externally available to be augmenting the data that you already have. And you can be improving the quality of the data sets that you have um, by through imputation. Um, and this is one of the things that we do you know, a lot, um, understanding that health systems don't have perfect data. Um, so I would just say you can be starting to get um, involved in AI, even while you are still investing in the quantity and quality of data um, that you're gathering across your system, um, and that the AI will continue to improve on top of that. Um, the third point um, is thinking about just nudging. So how do you nudge people um, to be making better decisions through AI? I and mean, what are the kinds of decisions that you want to be able to help support people to make? Um, and you can do that by actually integrating um, intelligence from AI into their current workflows. And so for us, for example, it's, you know, how much of a particular product might you want to order um, for your health facility in the next month? Um, so thinking about that, about how can you actually just be taking AI and integrating it into their current work workflow to make um, for slightly better decisions? Thank you, Carolina. Yeah, I think that that's a, that's a great point to, to, to end with. And I think, you know, finding and, 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 and creating and mapping out uh, AI solutions that are out there uh, for emerging markets, and there are many of them, and really uh, working with the data that's already available and, and really trying to, to make sense of all of that data. And, and yes, I, I, I totally agree with Brittany. It's not the perfect data yet. We're, we're just starting in a lot of, of, of this context, but really 
building uh, a strong and robust uh, data collection tools and, and systems with a uh, multi-sectoral approach, because I think that's super key uh, to understanding, for example, how maybe uh, kids at school have some, you know, some sort of pattern that might identify uh, some trends in disease prevention or um, disease outbreaks, et cetera. So really working on that and really from, from, from a standpoint of, of investing in, in, health, uh, in health data and, and, and health tools for emerging markets is really uh, showcasing because there are a lot of, of, of very successful solutions out there ready to scale and, and in transition to scale and they need to be uh, supported. Uh, yeah. Great. And Paul, what do you recommend for the organizations in the room? Yeah, so I would say two real quick things. One, your patient is a consumer first and they have a consumer digital experience. They bring that to the conversation when they walk in the door of the clinic and they get healthcare. So my observation or challenge to you is consumer focused design applies all the way through the value chain. And if you start with the patient experience, remember the patient experience all the way through, you will be much more successful. And that is true whether you're talking about AI for marketing, AI for clinical work, AI for B2B experiences, start with the patient, stay with the patient, and remember they come to the conversation with a, oftentimes with a digital experience outside of their healthcare. Great, Natasha, <laughs> last word. Okay, I'm gonna take a slightly different spin. I'm gonna challenge you all to start with what is the problem you're trying to solve? And is digital the right means to that end? And if that's the case, then what is the role of artificial intelligence? And then last but not least, how does this fit within the national digital health strategy of the country in which you're operating in? The, the thing I would hate to see is everyone running off to go experiment with AI and coming up with their, their individual point solutions that aren't tied to a broader goal. We talked about how investment in this space is limited and the best thing we could possibly do is support country governments in their national digital health strategies and develop solutions that help support them in their goals. Great. Well, um, join me, please, in thanking this incredible panel that I think had a master class with us today. I want to thank all of you and um, your, your great questions for seeding us and challenging us and making this more fun and lively. So thanks again. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to be back in person, aren't you? I mean, I think it's obvious <laughs> with, with everyone wanting to continue their chats. My name is Sarah Anderson, and I'm Executive Director of the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. And I'm here to just tell you that the state of the Alliance is well. In three short years, we have grown from 12 members to 82 members. And at... <laughs> As of last night, we welcomed our newest member, Roche Diagnostics. <laughs> and Joanna is here waving and I look forward to working with you and your colleagues. Not only have we grown in size, our multi-sector network has grown geographically. While we'll hold on to the, our region's roots in innovation and technology, we are expanding our scope to more intentionally include more partners in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. We are so glad that the Africa CDC was able to join us today. Last summer, we took a listening tour with more than 60 interviews and conversations with different people to learn about what you valued most. You value that we are a neutral convener, a safe space for candid conversations and for programs like today. You value our communications, amplifying your voices and the work that you're doing in equity and innovation and the connections. You all like the connections. I think seeing the connectivity in this room is certainly a part of that. But what we do with our connections is particularly we're really brokering collaborations across the sectors 
and conducting non-traditional players and engaging the tech sector. But what I'm most proud of that came out of the listening tour is that you told us that this is a trusted community where you all can come out of your silos and across the sectors and that we could collaborate and advance global health equity together. Thank you so much for helping us earn your trust. And thank you to all of you. You all are the heart of the Alliance. And thank you to the board for their leadership and to our staff. We also heard that you all wanted us to go deeper, to explore how we together could make a greater collective impact. Today's program and our lightning talks on new initiatives are acting on that call. We are happy to go into more depth about our strategy later. And I hope you know that I'm available, Lisa, Abby, we're always available to you for longer conversations. And we also want to import, tell you that we want to continue to listen and listen hard about what's working for you, what's not, so that we can share those insights and help all of us achieve global health equity. We really wanna remain your trusted partner. We encourage you to use the QR code, which links to a Google form to capture your questions and to indicate any interest that you have in all these different areas that we talked about. And what's coming up are a bunch of lightning talks that will kind of give you a preview of some of the things, talks and initiatives that are coming. They're in a way kind of teasing the next half of the year. And with that, let me turn over to Hema Budraju, our co-vice chair of the board and senior director of product, health, search, and social impact at Google. So Hema, over to you. Good to see you all. Sorry, I'm missing uh, the energy in person. So I appreciate you guys uh, giving me an opportunity to do this uh, virtually. So what's the theme for the talk today? Uh, a little bit of it is from the context of the role that I play at Google. And uh, I know my colleague Claudia is in the room. Please go find her if you have questions uh, later. Uh, the, over the last three years, as part of uh, Google, we launched a number of health products, right? Things that are on how do we help people find the best information on COVID through testing, through vaccines, through appointments. Um, we've added hundreds and thousands of providers in the US on maps and search so that people can find the right provider. We've added functionality to find which insurance is accepted or how do you make appointments? And most recently, things around Medicare re-enrollment as to who's eligible and how do we make that simpler. How about if we actually look global? It's not just physical health, but how would we think about mental health and suicide prevention and screeners for anxiety, depression, PTSD, and so on. All of these have some things in common, right? One is, how do we think about the people that we are serving? How do we know that there's an actual need that can be served through information that comes together? Do we have the right partners? Because health inherently is, you have to be responsible when building products. So how do we make sure that the information is credible, authoritative, timely? Who are the partners that we work with? How do we know that even with the best of intentions, we may, we may inadvertently cause some, I would say losses in the process and how do we safeguard for it? How do we have, like, one of the coolest things in working on health products at Google is the fact that we have a clinical team, a fully like 50 plus doctors who are also Google employees who work with us to understand the clinical impact of any product that we roll out. What's the reason to actually talk about this? Many of you, many, many, many of you, in fact, most of you, all of you, are looking to have like 
an impact on global health, on public health. If you're interested in joining a workshop where we talk through how do we think through a user problem, how do we understand the user's needs and validate that through research and data, how do we actually build products, how do we engage the ecosystem, how do we make sure that we set this up in a way that we can control for unintended consequences and responsibly build out products and then measure them too. Sarah asked me if I would be willing to host a workshop and, uh, and, and have uh, interest in the audience. So this is a teaser to say we are excited to see if there is interest from the Alliance members to participate in such a conversation. We can go through a dozen examples, but we can actually also pick up examples from you and say here are two or three examples that we can bring to the table and how do we bring some of the product managers, some of the researchers, some of the designers, some of the clinicians who worked on things at Google and we bring it to the Alliance members and say, let's workshop this together. I'll actually also note that there is, there is no one right way to doing this, right? So this is not some magic formula. This is not the only way to build right things. This is one of the things that we are proud of as Googlers to have worked through with many of you in this room and with global organizations around the world over the last three years to bring innovations in health. So some of it comes from that knowledge of we made a difference, so how do we share it? But equally, there'll be best practices from each of you who decide to join the workshop. So my invitation is if you're interested, let's figure out a way to have a workshop where we can have these conversations and look at solving problems at scale. Sarah, I'll hand this back to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hema. And you can use the QR code on your tables to kind of um, show your interest if you would like to be part of this workshop. We're going to look at doing that in November. So thank you so much, Hema. This was great. I'm excited about the months to come. And a Darren will be our next one who is also serves on our board and is with Pfizer. Darren, back. Can you all hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, and I apologize that I can't be with you today um, on the West Coast, but I also apologize for any background noise because it's ironic that in Florida there are major storms right now. So you, we're doing the lightning round with thunder in the background where I am. Um, so I just very quickly wanted to touch through this lightning round on Pfizer's access initiative that we launched a year ago. But more importantly, building on a lot of the discussion that we've had today get us to start thinking about what do multi-sector partnerships need to look like to be more effective, particularly in our post-COVID world. We, we've all learned so much, but how do we bring those insights together to move more quickly in terms of how we address health equity? So if you move on to the next slide, I'll just very quickly touch on our access initiative. So hopefully most people have heard about this, but a call for a healthier world is something that we launched last year with the goal of really trying to close the health equity gap for 1.2 billion people living in 45 lower income countries around the world. Now, from a foundational perspective for us as in Pfizer, our contribution is offering our full portfolio of medicines and vaccines for which we hold global rights on a not-for-profit basis to governments in all of those 45 countries. So this includes all of our innovative products, um, all of our future innovative products that may get approved, um, and then all of our generic products as well. So when you think about that, we're opening up more than 350 products, um, many of which are on the essential medicines list um, to these countries with the aim of providing consistent and quality supply to these countries. Now, since we launched in May last year, we, we've made steady progress. But of course, as we've talked about today, um, access to products is just the first step. Um, there are huge barriers that we're facing and countries are facing, which we talked about with regards to infrastructure, treatment availability, financing and affording. And what we've also talked a lot about today is how we need to come together to co-create and they have to be government-led solutions 
as a multi-sector partnership to think through how do we address these barriers and how do we do it quickly and effectively. And so really that's what I'd like to pitch now and say that if you go on to the next slide is I'd love to continue the discussion, um, hopefully in the fall, to really think through um, what do multi what, what do multi sector partnerships look like now, and do we need to redesign the model? How can we activate partners more quickly? How can we have bigger impact? You know, we've heard a lot today around the role of digital and AI. So many tools in advancing health equity, but. What's the conversation around how we come together? What are the principles that allow us to operate with speed and impact versus the more traditional coalition building and advocacy that we're all used to? Um, we said it takes a village. So as I say, I'm looking forward to exploring this together further in the fall. Um, and, we'll, and you'll hear more from, from Sarah and we'll make sure that you have access to that discussion. Thank you so much, Darren. Let me turn this over to James Bear, who will talk about innovative finance. It's one of the org one of the things we also heard on the, the the tour is that you all wanted more information about global health financing. And here is James to tell you a little bit more about some of the work that they're doing. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Are you all hearing me? This is it good? Yeah. Are you hearing me? Yes. Okay, great. Excellent. Uh, I'm sorry not to be there. I'm a native San Franciscan. I still live in the city, although a lot of my time is spent um, in Europe. If we could go to the first slide, uh, Madavi, I'd appreciate it. Um, I think in describing now, Carolina, my colleague, who was on in the earlier uh, AI focus session, already did a beautiful job of kind of overviewing the, the, the mission of Barack Impact Finance. So I don't want to be redundant. Um, I want to use this as an opportunity to kind of reflect on the ecosystem in which Baraka is, is active. So we are focused on catalyzing specifically private sector capital for global health solutions, excuse me, in, in low and middle income countries. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a schematic that I find kind of grounds the conversation and you get a chance to see who we are and how we're, uh, how we're participating. Um, so we have really three primary legs of our work, our incredible pipeline of innovators, and I'll talk a little bit more about those innovators, uh, all focused on LMIC solutions, the vast majority uh, based in uh, their, 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 their domiciles in which they're active, um, and an 800 plus investor network, and I want to focus on that now, and then the health investment intelligence dashboard, which I'll also tell you about. Our objective is the double bottom line, measurable, scalable social impact and market rate returns. So we are an impact investment focused consultancy. And uh, you know our primary audience uh, are, is this investor network. In my dreams, it's a homogeneous group that all knows what they want and we're serving it up to them. That's not at all the way it is. Uh, as Carolina said earlier, we are building the airplane as we fly. And most of the investors are taking turns deciding if they wanna be on that airplane with us or not. We represent um, foundations, uh, both private and uh, uh, corporate foundations, uh, DFIs, uh, high net worth individuals, family offices, um, and a host of other um, financial entities who are interested in so social investment, but have a vastly different idea about the social impact metrics that they're seeking and the amount of return that they want to see for their investments. So we are in a process uh, evolving with the ecosystem to determine what those needs are and do whatever we can, as I said, to accelerate uh, capital deployment. Um, and just if you could click once more, I want to thank you, Madavi. I just want to emphasize we are a social enterprise and our, our uh, uh, mission is to leave a lasting impact and the tools that will uh, create an ongoing flow from the private sector into global health solutions in uh, underserved populations around the world. Okay, next slide, please. So um, the 280 plus, I think we're actually closer to 300 right now, um, innovators that we represent, uh, are across the entire health continuum that you see depicted here. Um, they are 80% based in their countries of operations. So that is uh, roughly 30% of our, of our pipeline is based in Latin America, approximately 30% in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
and an approximately 30% in Asia, a, a predominance in India with a scattering in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and the companies that we have decided to focus on during our short time in existence, about three years now, uh, are those with two to 10 years of operating history and actively raising one to 20 million. And there's a long learning curve, or it feels long to me because I was on it, uh, about knowing that that was the focus of Baraka's efforts. And the reason that became the focus is A, it turns out there are a lot of companies. The universe is not infinite, but it's large. Companies that have already addressed many of the challenges in their local markets. They're thinking about multi-market strategies uh, and, they, um, and they need capital. And that valley of death in emerging economies is so much deeper than the valley of death that we all understand uh, in the developed world in the, in the US and the EU. Uh, let me emphasize also with this slide that what Baraka does is a very thorough vetting process, uh, uh, two levels, uh, a kind of an onboarding process, and then a very deep dive, six part, 70 question, usually anywhere from four to six week iterative process with the founders in order to understand their social impact metrics, uh, the KPI that they're using uh, in order to, uh, to, 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 to monitor those, those metrics, uh, and then the, the ability to scale. Um, okay, next slide, please. One of the core elements of the Baraka vision was always to online enable uh, these uh, companies so that investors could have easy visibility to it. We're really blessed to have received a significant uh, grant from Johnson & Johnson Foundation, and we are in the active process right now of uploading 50 of our 280 or so companies uh, and inviting a select group of 25 global investors and they're being selected for their diversity, for their active allocation and for their geographic focus uh, to come and see these opportunities uh, on a platform. And then, you, then we use uh, third party data from the World Bank, IHME, and the UNDP's SDG Investor Hub, who we are partnered with, uh, in order to provide market contextualization. Uh, and this was original to the Baraka vision. It took us a while to find a willing partner like Johnson & Johnson. And apropos to several other comments that were made, it's important for me to tell you that Johnson & Johnson, we've been working with them in a couple of uh, different capacities, but their interest in this project was first and foremost to drive opportunities for co-investment. They have the experience of doing uh, innovation investments and having to search uh, all over to get the right type of multi-sector uh, uh, partners uh, at the investment table. Uh, so we have front-loaded many of the uh, functionalities uh, on this uh, pilot um, uh, towards that uh, partnership objective. If you can go to the next slide, I'll run you. We have a beautiful demo. We don't really have that. Oh, let me say one thing. I'm not sure that this group is aware. I'd be interested if they could see a, a show of hands. How many people are aware of the G7 proclamation that got made in Hiroshima about three weeks ago, uh, a commitment uh, to uh, run this triple I for global health. I think that's their working title right now, but it's impact investment initiative for, for, for global health. Um, where they're trying to bring a significant uh, uh, group of stakeholders together uh, to, to, to accelerate specifically impact investment um, in global health communities uh, around the world. So uh, this pilot uh, funded by Johnson & Johnson will be launched uh, in conjunction with the United Nations General Assembly uh, in September. And if you go to the next slide, I'll round up here by just showing you, and you'll have to go click through one at a time, if you can click again. So what the um, dashboard does is provide investors uh, an opportunity to profile their own investment interests. So this first panel, you're not going to be able to read it, is a faux investor who's indicated the areas that they're interested in, their general ticket size, uh, other investments currently that they're invested in, uh, and the types of partners that they work with. And then click again, please, Madhavi. They then, as an investor, you can filter for the type of investment uh, you're interested in by a whole bunch of different criteria, everything from SDGs to geographies to subsectors within health um, and uh, ticket size, et cetera. Once you've filtered, you'll get a short list, both a map version and thumbnails of those uh, investments that fit your criteria. And the next uh, click, please. 
and then you'll be brought to a profile page. The profile page and two or three other tabs following this page describe in detail uh, the company, uh, the current opportunity, uh, and demonstrate the due diligence that uh, we at Baraka have already worked on together with the founders in order to provide a very robust profile and everything from financial projections to social impact to governance structure, et cetera. And then finally, in the last tab, uh, is where, in one more click, there you go, is where we bring in the market intelligence. Initially with this pilot, we're using World Bank, IHME, and UNDP data in order to provide everything from burden of disease to infrastructure uh, to health payment uh, uh, systems. Uh, and, and other commentary that help an investor quickly understand the specific value of this intervention in the specific market that it's being deployed in. So that we're super excited about it. We are completely underfunded to do it, not because of Johnson & Johnson, but because it's like boiling oceans right now. We've got a small committed team spread out between India, Colombia, Saudi Arabia, Europe, and the US. There's about eight of us, and we're working really hard to bring this to fruition. And I would love to have a chance to talk with more of you about it uh, when I'm back in the Bay Area. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. James, thanks so much. That was a great presentation, and we look forward to hearing more. And so we'll have that workshop in July. So that'll be coming up pretty soon, and we'll find a time to bring James back so people don't have to talk rapid fire all the time. <laughs> So thank you. And with that, let me bring in Neha Agarwal, who serves as our co-vice chair of the board of directors for the Bay Area Global Health Alliance. She is also the global program co-lead of diagnostics at PATH. And with that, Neha, over to you. Thanks so much, Sarah. And um, it's great to be following James. I think there's some real nice synergies between our overlapping interests in innovative financing as a tool that's somewhat underutilized in the global health space. So excited to see um, some partnership opportunities there. But good morning to you all and good afternoon to many of you calling in from other parts of the world. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Neha Agarwal and I have the pleasure of representing PATH on the board of the Bay Area Global Health Alliance, as well as serving as the co-vice chair of the Alliance. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person today, but I completely agree with Sarah. I can sense the energy in the room, and I think it, it re is really great to see um, so many of, of you all um, convened in the same room. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm very excited to be sharing some early thinking from the Alliance on innovative approaches to curb AMR and promote global AMR stewardship programs, particularly in low and middle income countries. So as many of you know, probably better than I, antimicrobial resistance or AMR is caused by overuse or inappropriate use of antibiotic drugs. And it has emerged as one of the leading public health threats of the 21st century. Some people have dubbed it the si silent pandemic. It is estimated that 1.3 million lives are lost annually due to AMR alone. And this toll is expected to increase to 10 million lives by the year 2050. So one critical solution to combating AMR is to focus on new antibiotic drug development. And many of you in this room, many of you um, who are Alliance members are very actively involved and engaged in innovative partnerships such as CARB-X, the AMR Action Fund, GARD-P, to advance a, a really rich pipeline of new antibiotics through robust R&D efforts. These efforts are much needed and hold great promise for the future availability of much needed new and effective antibiotics. AMR stewardship programs offer another critical solution to the rising threat of resistance. Stewardship programs as outlined by the WHO and national governments provide clinical guidance for appropriate use of antibiotics and best practices for reducing the development of AMR. And many of the academic and industry partners uh, in the room, again, are already taking a very leading role in supporting the implementation of these guidelines all over the globe. But they're drastically underfunded and in many cases don't really account for the specific um, economic incentives and financial incentives that are surrounding uh, the, um, the behaviors that require 
change in the prescription of antibiotic usage. We see a very specific role for the Alliance to raise awareness of the silent pandemic and to increase advocacy and coordination around these efforts. And we're really eager to partner across our membership to under, understand and address the issues surrounding misaligned economic incentives. We see a very specific role for innovative financing and implementation science to also appropriately incentivize health provider networks to pilot innovative business models and service delivery approaches that can help prevent the overuse of antibiotics. We've seen financial incentives and outcomes-based financing positively impact metrics for AMR stewardship in places like the UK and Japan, but what we haven't seen are piloting those tools in lower resource settings, such as the settings that many of us work in, and we're really eager to fill this gap. The multifaceted issues leading to the rise of AMR intersects behavioral science, infectious disease management, one, one health approaches, health economics, implementation science, innovative financing, and many more disciplines. And we've already heard throughout the day so many of our partners working at the intersection of all of these. And it is this, for this reason that we believe the Alliance can play a really critical role in bridging a multi-sectoral partnership to curb AMR. So this is just a, a quick sneak peek and we'll be sharing more details with all of you in the coming months. We are aiming to convene um, around this topic specifically sometime in the fall, maybe shooting for October based on all of the other convenings that are happening. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, if you or your organization are interested in being involved, please do reach out to myself, Sarah, uh, Colin Boyle, who's in the room, or anyone in the secretariat, we'd love to get involved and, and engage with all of you um, to figure out how we can really bring multiple partners together in this space. So we look forward to your feedback and partnership and really making a concerted effort towards curbing AMR. So thank you, Sarah. I'll turn it back to you. Thanks so much, Neha. That was wonderful. And we will be having that sometime in the fall, probably October, but we'll, we'll talk to Neha and see what works with her schedule. This example of AMR, taking a deeper dive on AMR and innovative financing is what we're calling in our strategy um, a signature initiative of where the alliance with our members can kind of come together to make a, a greater collective impact. So that's one of them. And it's part of the program investments committee. And one of the things that's another way that we have somewhat evolved this year with moving that forward. And then the other one that we want to talk about will be the next one. So I'll bring up our guest in just a second. I do have to, um, we will have to do from um, Gilead Sciences and Aditi Rowe, who is serving as our Global Health Fellow. And before we do that, I need to give a mic over to Colin Boyle and to Mark Allen, because they are part of this group as well. <laughs> Thank you all. And two over to you. Sure, thank you. And welcome everyone to Global Health Family Feud today. This is the game where we survey 100 people for the best answer to today's question. And our contestants must try to guess the most frequently cited response. So contestants, are you ready to play? Ready, oh, ready. ready. <laughs> Great, let's meet the team. Um, please tell us your name and what you do. Hi, I'm Colin, and I'm an academic researcher focused on clinical epidemiology. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mark Allen, and I am focused on global health uh, and money, because I'm private sector. <laughs> <laughs> and hi, everyone. I'm the final contestant. I'm Aditi, and I'm an NGO implementing partner also in global health. Great. Thank you so much. Today, we're going to ask you um, what the best response on a key component of implementation science and health equity is. Colin, our researcher, what word or phrase best describes unmet need? Clearly, the answer here is clinical burden of disease. That is how one appropriately defines unmet need. <laughs> Great answer. Good answer. Good answer. <laughs> Let's see if we have it on the board. Madavi. 
Yes. Welcome to the our contestants. Um, let's hear from our next contestant from the NGO world. Aditi, how would you define unmet need? I think unmet need uh, would be community voiced needs and preferences for improving their healthcare. And what I mean by this is what services and products do our communities value and need? Okay, let's see if we have it on the board. Community needs and preferences. Yes, it's on the board. Um, now, lastly, let's hear from our private sector contestant, Mark. What phrase best defines unmet need? Yeah, from the private sector side, I think um, excessive uh, uh, unmet need in terms of um, access to life-saving medicines, therapeutics, vaccines, um, with a real focus on really wanting to shift to really focusing on volume and uh, really to place the value of where the, the unmet need is most in terms of making the biggest health impact. Great answer. Let's see if we have excess demand or, or volumes on the board. We do. Um, good job, everyone. And I'm so glad you gave these answers because as we can see the same concept of unmet need, which is such a critical component of each of us here today, it's considered differently and described differently by all different industries. So similarly, here at the Bay Area Global Health Alliance, our sponsor for today's Global Health Family Feud, um, we believe that many of the challenges in healthcare that one industry seeks to address are familiar to other industries. Um, but we often speak about them in siloed terminology, limiting the sharing of lessons and potential solutions. So therefore, this project that we're giving a, a lightning talk on today is motivated by the problem that too often promising health interventions do not reach the world's most vulnerable communities or are not effectively designed and adapted to community needs and constraints. This can result in significant unmet needs and growing health inequities. Therefore, we're seeking to close this gap by using the lens of implementation science, comprising of methods and strategies to facilitate the uptake of practices into regular use in order to advance health equity. My name is Tudo, um, and when I am not hosting Family Feud, I am a <laughs> medical director. I'm a director of medical affairs for Gilead Sciences, specifically on the Global Patient Solutions team. This is the team and the business unit dedicated to covering the majority of our low and lower middle income markets. One experience that I've seen in terms of implementation science is the low level of engagement with and the leadership of the private sector to both conduct and utilize implementation science to make sure our products are taken up by those that need them the most. So at GPS, Global Patient Solutions, this often looks like a patient in a weak health system that has limited resources and limited choices, prevent prevention, diagnostics, and treatment. I think we can all agree that there's much more progress to be made in PrEP uptake, specifically in the communities that bear the disproportionate burden of high transmission still. You know, this is happening despite good products and dedicated financing to access. So we really believe that a project like Implementation Science plus Health Equity can help us address some of those challenges. But over to you, Aditi, to say more. Thanks, too. Hi, everyone. My name is Aditi Rao. Um, I'm an anthropologist and implementation scientist. And I'm supporting this project as um, the Alliance's Global Health Fellow. And really, in my experience in global health research and practice, uh, I have so often seen a disconnect between needs identified and prioritized by researchers, by industry partners, and needs that are felt most deeply by the communities that we seek to serve. And therefore, very often, interventions that are designed to work in low-resource settings really fail to consider the reality of those settings, which include the health system, available resources and infrastructure, financial viability, and very importantly, the perceived value of the intervention by our communities themselves. Um, and these things are very often considered only after the fact, which um, we see really affect the uh, adoption and sustainability. And so we're really hoping this project can help us uh, learn some key lessons on how do we better design and implement um, programs so that they sustain and scale up the way we intend for them to. 
And um, so a little bit more about the project and the Alliance. So through this project, uh, we're seeking to uncover lessons um, from across sectors, which include academia, nonprofits, NGOs, the private sector and the public sector. Um, and we're really hoping to improve multi-sectoral collaboration. In short, uh, and we've heard so much about that today. Um, to ensure healthcare solutions are well designed. And we're using HIV and postpartum hemorrhage as uh, key examples. And this project, as you heard, is led by the Alliance um, as they're a multi-sector network and a trust and neutral convener. So they're guiding us through this. Um, and the next steps really for us is um, we have just completed a literature review to identify existing gaps in our understanding. And we're now planning multi-sector interviews and small group discussions with individuals from across the sectors that I just mentioned, which we're hoping will feed into a larger discussion and another convening in October. And our goal really is to translate everything that we learn into really actionable recommendations, which uh, we hope is helpful to all sectors. Back to you too. Sure, thanks. And, and thank you all for listening and, and participating today. We'd like to take this opportunity to invite you all to be part of this work. You can contribute by sharing relevant literature, sharing stories of successes or failures from your work and your experiences, uh, being part of landscaping interviews, and most certainly joining us for this larger convening that Aditi mentioned in October. So as you can see on the screen, um, please follow the link to the sh uh, short Google form to let us know how you'd be interested in contributing or if you just want to be a contestant on the next uh, episode of Global Health Game <laughs> Review. So thank you. Thanks so much to NADT and to both of you. That Family Feud was absolutely wonderful. And so with that, let me send it over to Colin uh, to close us out. Well. Uh Thank you all for being here. I just want to say a few uh, uh, final remarks just to thank you all for coming. Uh, th thank you for participating on Zoom, those who were able to. Thank you for being here today. I hope this was a, a useful and informative exercise. Um, you probably sent something if this is your second or third annual meeting. Um, we are trying as an alliance to unlock even more value in uh, for all of you uh, in terms of what, what it's worth for all of you to be a member of the alliance. And the reality is that all of the magic is in the community. It's in all of you and all of your organizations and all of the work you do. And our job as the Alliance is to help bring down some of the barriers that keep people who are working in the same space from working together. There's an old story uh, that I experienced only once uh, at UCSF, just one of our members, uh, where you know, the story is you know, people uh, meet each other on some sort of remote airfield in Kenya only to discover that they work down the hall from each other, but have never met before. That only happened to me once, um, but it, it happens apparently enough. It's a much bigger problem when we think about the Bay Area community. And our job is to really bring people together to convene, to sort of help people see the connections so that more value can, can be unlocked. If you look at global health, there've been a lot of successes over the last 20 to 30 years that we can all take great pride in. Most of those are multi-sector. They're new products that have been developed between a combination of innovative drug companies, nonprofits, government funders, successful programs that involve community-based design solutions, government funding, private philanthropy. We're better as a team than we are individually. And so this is an opportunity to work together as a team. So looking forward to continuing that and seeing many of you at these upcoming events that we've teased today. But I'll wrap up here with a, just a thank you to the Secretariat for all the hard work they, they put together in assembling this. Thank you to all of the speakers, but most of all, thanks to all of you for being here today and being a part of this discussion. Look forward to continuing it.